24, so everything gets kind of scrunched down, so there'll be some kind of flickering um, back and forth. <clears throat> so, make sure we got everything set up over there. Bum, bum, bum. All right, I know it's kind of small. I hope everyone can see this. So this is the basic test we're going to go over. Um, I'm, we're using PHP Unit, and PHP Unit has a plugin for Selenium. Um, and for those who aren't familiar uh, with it, I'm just going to quickly go, go through this. Um, so I'm extending a, a WebDriver test case, which is just a, a general object pattern of, of inheritance. And this then obviously then extends um, a Drupal Selenium test case, which is just another general object, kind of a helper object that I made. And then this, I can open that up. This then extends PHP unit um, extension Selenium test case. And this is PHP, PHP unit's plugin that does the Selenium testing for you. And like I said, it's, since it's open source, we can go and just kind of give anyone who's not familiar with it an idea. So I'll just open it this way. And inside of this PHP, you can see it's PHP unit Selenium. And then inside of this class is this function do command. And all I want to show you here is that it takes these commands that we're sending it. For example, open, wait for element present, takes command, sends it to the Selenium server that's waiting at that endpoint, um, and just uses good old curl, sends the HTTP command, gets information back, and that's the workflow that we're working with. So I'm just going to run a simple workflow here or a simple test. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to spin up uh, the Selenium server itself on my local machine. So you can see I have this jar file here, Selenium server, um, which you just download from the Selenium site. I'm just going to run it standalone. And you just run it like a simple jar file. You'll see it's launched the Selenium server, and if I go to this port, you'll see it started on port 444. You can see that it's running. And don't worry about the error, it's because we didn't send the right information. And then I'm just going to run this simple login test. I put some sleeps in because it goes really fast, so I tried to slow it down a little bit. And actually, I apologize for that. So these two lines are a way I switch between WebDriver and Selenium. So later in the talk, we'll, we'll go through that. But what I want to I want to run that test again to show one thing, and this will help when we go to the difference between Selenium and our Selenium one and WebDriver. So you'll see we have this control window up here. And in the bottom, we actually have the actual test running. <coughs> so plain and simple. And I think we all understand that. Are there any questions so far? We're all good? OK. All right, so we did our simple test. So now we kind of want to talk about WebDriver. So WebDriver is Selenium 2. Um, I, if, you, if you want, we can go into the history. But it was a separate project. But WebDriver is Selenium 2. And one of the main things that will, that um, was, that's kind of um, important about it is that it's kind of, they want to drive it from the user's point of view. They don't want to drive it as a browser, so to speak. And as I mentioned before, they, they drive it by the, by the browser's native API. So for example, Internet Explorer, if you were going to write something for Internet Explorer in the most efficient way, you'd probably fire up Visual Studio and probably program in C++ because its automation bindings are in C++. 
And uh, Firefox has, I think, XPCOM, which is it, its kind of plug-in device that's native to it. And that's what WebDriver does. It's, it drives a browser by its native API. So when you, for example, even though it's written in Java, Java has something called JNI, which is Java Native Interface, which allows you to um, uh, run C++ almost as if, if you're you know, natively uh, working with it. And so that's, that's the way they, they wrote web, uh, or WebDriver's um, architecture is set up. Um, it's also an actual standard. You can go and Google W3C WebDriver, and they're trying to make it a, a standard so that other things can interface with it. Um, so I want to go back to, I don't want to get too bogged down in the details of architecture. That one statement of they're trying to drive it from the user's point of view is um, kind of very important, and, and it kind of also changes the way you write tests, and it can also break your tests. So I have this uh, simple example. I call it the fortune teller. And uh, it, what it's going to show is how, you know, this concept in, in place, uh, Selenium 1 versus Selenium 2. Um, and also some of the side effects of writing in Selenium 1, how you can actually, you know, have tests that pass that shouldn't pass. So let's go ahead and go through the fortune teller. And I'm going to go through it manually first, just so we know how it's set up. OK, so it's really simple. Uh, it's not, um, and I'm almost out of power. I apologize. I'm going to plug in. So I'm going to put in any name, favorite color. Let's go with red, predict my future. And it says, Jim Brown, you're OK. It's a very simple. I wish fortune tellers were that nice. So <laughs> um, so our test, if we go look at our test, is pretty straightforward. Uh, we're going to open the web page. We're going to get a unique name, just a random name. We're going to put the name in. We're going to click the Next button like I did, uh, wait for the color text box to come up. And we're going to uh, put in a color. I arbitrarily chose blue. And then we're going to click Next. And we're going to look for that link that says Start Over. Um, now, just a little background about the fortune teller. I use the basic uh, Drupal AHA framework for I Ajax forms. So can anyone guess, I guess you can't, um, what will happen when I run this in, in Selenium 1? Because we did the user login test, which means you put in two text, you put in the, the information, the two text fields, and you told it to click the button. And we're doing the same thing here, which is what I just did manually. So let's go ahead and run it. I really wish I had a not a 10 by 24 screen. Yep, not small enough yet. You press the green, it will extend. What's the yes? So it did put in the name, and actually, to make this easier for you guys, give me, I'm going to run this in single window mode. Okay, so one hint is that the, and you can see it's now just waiting for that element to come up, or for the, edit, for the color question to come up. One hint is that the AHA framework um, actually doesn't fire, it attaches to this button using a mouse down event. And as we mentioned before, um, the Selenium 1 drives through JavaScript, so when you say click the button, it uses JavaScript and actually clicks the button, it fires the click event. And the problem is it only fires a click event. It doesn't actually do uh, a click on the button, which would fire all the events that would happen on the button, the mouse down, mouse up, and the click. So the difference is when I run the same test, 
switching to web driver mode. And all it does is extend a different, uh, it extends PHP unit Selenium 2 implementation instead of the Selenium 1 implementation. And we see it works perfectly fine because it's driving it from the native, um, from the native bindings and it actually just does a, like a mouse clicked here and then that, I, I, um, that bubbles down and does all the events that happened on that button. So if you've ever done um, uh, autocomplete fields, for example, the on blur event, usually you have to do a fire event on blur because when you lose focus, it actually doesn't fire the, uh, the blur event. When you use WebDriver, it actually fires. When you lose focus and go someplace else, it actually fires a blur event because it's actually driving it like a user instead of through JavaScript where you're kind of only doing um, one item and not the full stack. And I have another example, um, but do you guys all understand that? Okay. And the other example real quick is that So what I did was I, I, I put in some JavaScript that just disables the um, name field. And again, if we go back to our, just our simple basic login test, and I, just, I made a test called basic typing. It's just going to type in those fields and do an, uh, an absolute assertion, which will always be true, totality, if you will. And if I do this in Selenium 1, Uh, yes. We'll see that even though it's disabled, it puts the username in there. Um, and if I if I switch that, or if I just switch to WebDriver. <laughs> So it's not even going to type it because to WebDriver, it says that field's not available for me to manipulate. So again, from the user's point of view, that one line just changes how you write your tests and how WebDriver goes about um, throwing errors and seeing what's available for, for it to do. So you get like kind of real feedback. And these are very basic, uh, simple examples. But it, it, once you start getting kind of into more complicated items, you'll get hit with things like um, if you have a drop down menu and you try and do a get text to see what's in there. Selenium 1 will give you the full um, UL, the full um, ordered list. Oh, yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt. That's okay. But we're looking to try to accommodate everyone. I see you're a very popular man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we were thinking about possibly whenever you went to break is changing this out to a theater style so we can get more folks in here. Would that be okay with you guys, or would you rather keep what it is for now, or what is your choice? It, it's, it's up to the group. Um, I can have the hotel ready to go, and we can knock it out real quick, and we would need everybody to leave the room with their stuff at that time. Okay. I, um, I'm almost to the, next, to, to the next section of organization, so like fi five minutes. Five minutes from now? Yeah, five minutes, and yeah, I could really use some coffee anyway, so. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, that's okay. Um, where was I? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, No, and actually, that's my next slide. So, <laughs> so I'm glad you asked. Um, so, 
you know, that's that's kind of the difference of from a user's point of point of view. So, and when you do uh, get text with with WebDriver, you'll only see what the user can see. You'll only see the my account. You won't see their logout or the other drop downs in there. So it really is kind of saying. And then you can do more complicated things. Something's overlaying that. You know, the user couldn't. You know, it it really does kind of go from what the user can do. Um, so that said, um, I was you know excited about WebDriver and. It's nice, and my tests are slow, and isn't this going to fix it because it's new and fancy? Um, and the one thing I found out is that WebDriver gives me stability. Um, it, it's, it's more human-like, like we just went over. Uh, Sorry, that's okay. 40 okay. If you want to just wait till then, that'll give us ample time to do it. Uh, yeah, I think. Oh yeah, that's fine. I, I think I, I only have I'm only till eleven forty five. Yeah. Okay, so right at that. Yeah, what? But it's only I only have an hour session. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If I don't leave you alone, you won't get done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, and there's la less what I call JavaScript hacking. Um, if you've worked with tests, I'm sure we've all done weird fire events, or we've actually pulled um, the browser bot, uh, which if someone's not familiar with the browser bot, it's j it's the actual JavaScript. <laughs> Um, from Selenium 1 that drives a browser uh, and kind of gives you a, a truer picture. Uh, so that said, the one thing I didn't mention in the differences was uh, speed. Um, and even though it's using you know, the, the native APIs, um, stability and the user's point of view was really what they were driving for. And what I found is there's not really a big difference in speed between the two. Um, if anything, I think WebDriver might be a slightly slower, a tidbit you know, here and there. Um, but I, you don't, it's not a magic pill where if you're having slower tests, going to WebDriver 2 or going to WebDriver is just going to give you this massive, or not massive, like a 20% speed increase. Uh, from working with it and from, you know, doing some test implementations, I've, I haven't found any difference. Um, I shouldn't say any difference, but mu much difference between the two. If you're looking for speed, moving to WebDriver isn't going to solve that problem. Um, so to answer your, your performance and speed question, no. I, I, for 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 my personal experience, um, so from from there, um, I guess we're not breaking. Should I just go on to um, organization of tests? And whatnot. All right. So um, that's pretty cool. We've got a, a new tool. It's it's fun to play. Oh yes. Uh huh. I'm sorry, it's a web driver. Um, the drawbacks to web driver. Uh, writing tests can, like, it, it's nice from a developer's point of view to be able to um, do JavaScript hacks or, for example, like, it, it is frustrating to like, you, you want to check to see if something's in this, in this uh, drop down or in this element that maybe the user can't see, but for you, you just need to assert that it's there. But you have to, you have to kind of test it in some other way, something that the user can see. So it, it, it's a little frustrating in that regard. Secondly, um, it's nice that it's using the native API, so that also makes development uh, slower. So you know, we, I, if you're using Selenium, um, you know they, they kind of have a fast release cycle, um, especially with Firefox seeming to release every month um, and updates. But uh, it does make it slower because you have this translation going on. Um, another drawback to WebDriver, I think those are only, those are the two major ones that that for me that I wanted to mention was. Um, it's it's not a magic pill. Uh, it it in my experience has made testing sometimes uh, a little frustrating or, or, or harder. Um, and uh, it from and I'm fortunately I'm not working on it. But if I was working on the driver implementations, it makes it a little bit slower. Because yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that's a that's a double. Ed the yes, yes. Uh, the question was um, someone new to the organization writing tests, and they were able to use the. Uh, there's a Firefox uh, pl plugin um, that allows you to basically record your test. Uh, it's what they call the HTML um, 
uh, HTML unit test, HTML unit? Yes, yes, and, and so it allows you to just basically record your tests and then replay them. So instead of writing them like this, you're able to record your tests and, and, and replay them. Um, and the question is, what does, is will WebDriver allow this because it seems uh, you know, it, it can only be used in the hands of a programmer? And I, I think that's a, it's a complicated question. So for example, with um, the IDE, yeah, you can, you can record the tests, but some, some tests are more complicated where you're, you need, you know, a, you need um, a developer to write the test. You have to do it by hand. Um, and also, I would, I would say, yes, you know, you'll always be able to, like I, when I'm switching between the two in terms of uh, Selenium 1 and Selenium 2, uh, you know, you can use an ID and ID and record your test and, and, and run it against run it that way. Um, so, with that, with that regard, yes. But you'll always, I think, need, and especially in a larger organization or a more complicated site, a developer to write the test anyway. So I do agree. Yeah, they, it there will be an ID and you, they can use the ID, but you'll always have these complicated tests um, that you'll need a developer for and. Not, not only the testing, but when you, you know, the architecture of fixtures and, uh, you know, tear down and set up and, you know, it's like when you, when you start to get into um, a lot of tests, like when we go through organizing tests, you know, it's, it's if, um, for example, if you have 54, let's say you have 100 tests and they're testing some widget and then the UX comes in and they totally redo the CSS, which, or, and the DOM structure changes. Um, usually, uh, the IDU uses XPath, and if the DOM changes, you have to then go back and redo all those recordings. Where if you have, um, well, we'll talk about this, but you know, there's ways to, to mitigate those um, to, those changes where they're not as painful. Where you can kind of go into one place, um, update this area, and then go forward. So it's 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 a kind of catch twenty two depending on which specific area we're talking about. Did that answer your question? Okay. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's fairly portable between those two. It, it is. Um, uh, well, but I should, I should, with a caveat, say that underneath, I do have a translation layer. Um, and, I, and for this talk, since I only have an hour, I didn't want to go too deep into, um, and we can do that if we have time at the end, migrating from Selenium 1 to Selenium 2. Um, but th for example, there's, just a, there's a slight translation layer, but it is, the translation layer took me, you know, uh, a couple, couple hours to write. You know, it's not complicated, it's just, um, you know, slightly different functions. And so it's like, if you call this function, I just override it and this is the one that you should call. So anyway, yeah. Um, I guess my question was, is there are other web driver type choices out there? So mm -hmm. you've got water, you've got zombie, yep. mm -hmm. et cetera. How portable have you found it in general? That if you, yeah, especially going into where you're going now, which mm -hmm. is the idea of speed and testing, how difficult it is to write tests, mm -hmm. et cetera. I mean, when you pick uh, a path of what you're writing the test for, are you pretty much locking yourself into, say, Selenium? Uh. Me personally, I would say no. Um, so the problem, uh, I didn't say the problem. So with Selenium, like like, like this open and, and wait for element, those are Selenium commands. But like I said, there's a translation layer underneath. So if you were to abstract it into your own kind of domain language or pseudo language and then have your own translation layer under, under it, uh, which some languages do do, they kind of have an abstraction layer and then you can use whatever implementation underneath you want to, then I would say you're not really locked in because I could, if you know something, if something's uh, method for opening a page is uh, get, get the page, then I would just override the open function, you know, just general, uh, you know, um, object oriented um, programming and just override it and say, instead of that, use this, you know, and so I, I would, I, I would say, yeah, on one hand you are because you're used to, you know, wait for element and, and whatnot and use that one language. Um, but on the other hand, you, if you really needed to, and this was really going to help you, then you could go that way. But then that's a question of, do you just re redo it anyway? Um, so, uh, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what about migrating from the Selenium IDE to like, web driver tests? Can they be run in the web driver? Uh, there, there is a test runner for the IDE test. Um, I've and web driver. Uh, I'm actually not sure if there is. I'm, I'm pretty sure there is, and you could definitely, because you, you can, it's just an HTML table. So from a programming standpoint, yeah, yes, you can, as far as, as, far as one standard, standard, standard implementation. Uh, I believe I, I'm pretty sure there is. I know there I know there is in Java, um, so I, I'm pretty sure there is uh, for a WebDriver to uh, a, a test runner for 
the for the IDE or the um, HTML ones. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, um, yeah, so we're gonna go through organizing tests. So you, I, I, when you start using the tool, you'll start, <coughs> excuse me, writing a lot of tests. Um, as a caveat, uh, this information is taken from Selenium, uh, Selenium's own, own website. Uh, they have some great information and resources there. It's also just um, from my personal experience uh, doing tests um, both in, uh, you know, I've done Selenium under Java with JUnit and also, you know, in PHP, so just some, some practices uh, that I found um, out in consulting and also at my, at my current job uh, with The Economist. Um, so the first thing we're going to go over are uh, page objects. And page objects uh, allow you to get this, separ this separation of um, test code and, um, and, and what I, what's called, I like to, they say page objects, but I like to just call it an object because I think that better describes it. And the object is just some resource, like a, a user or a home page or you know, kind of think of it as like maybe some feature. And um, users is a good example, and I'm going to go through um, uh, the, a user example. Uh, but they're definitely useful for objects that you use a lot, um, uh, a lot of the time. So for page objects, we're going to look at two, two tests. And so we have our, our basic login test that we remember from um, from previously. Um, opens the user, puts in the username and password, and, and hits submit. And then I, I made this test PO login, um, which is page object. And you'll see I have this new object here called user, and I just give it you know an instance of um, of the PHP unit Selenium test class. And you can see the difference between the tests. Instead of me having to know in my test, um, and I shouldn't care, but in my in my test login that I have to type in the edit name and edit password and edit, edit you know my edit name, my edit pass, and what the username and password is. I have this user object, and I can tell the user object to do certain things, and then do my assertions after it has done its work. So, for example, a login, you know, I shouldn't have to care about okay, how do I do that? And usually, you have to go find an example. I should be able to instantiate an object and tell it to do a login or some other complicated. Um, uh, 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 not method, but uh, workflow. Um, so inside of this DC user object <laughs> is we just have a constructor, and we have um, a register user function. <clears throat> and the register user function just, uh, where does that go? Uh, sorry, the create user function just creates a random name, um, goes to the register page, fills all the information, registers the user, and then returns, um, it, it registers the user and then, re and then returns the object. So from there, you have a user object, and the, user, the object knows, OK, this is my username, this is my password. I know the information about myself. What do you want to ask me? What do you want me to do now? And then with that, I tell it to log out, and then I tell it to log in, and I just do a simple assertion. Now you can see, um, this is a very basic example, but you can see if you're, uh, and we, we've all been there, if your registration and login, or in login process, especially your registration process is pretty complicated and you need to do it all the time, you could one, abstract it into a function, uh, register user, but uh, with a page object, it, it, it's, um, it's more abstract and more powerful because you don't just register, it knows how to do all the things that that feature should do. It knows how to register or send itself an email or check its email and then you do your assertions off of, um, off of that. Uh, does that concept make sense? Okay, I just wanna make sure I'm explaining everything very well. Um, so I can run through this example uh, where time's kind of kind of short. Does, any, yep. does anyone wanna run through it? No, okay. Um, so next. I want to go over the example I kind of talked about before, which is user interface mapping. So like we were talking about, uh, I kind of mentioned before, um, if you, you've got this, all these tests, and you can think, you know, down the road, someone's going to say, we want to, we want to change, you know, this feature, we want to change how it looks, or we need to put in a, a new element. And then you've got to go through all your tests that reference 
that, that location, whether via XPath or some other locator, because once the DOM structure changes to locate it, you have to change, um, you know, you have to change how you, how you find it. And what UI mapping does is it allows you basically, um, from a simplistic point of view, it's just constants. It's just uh, for, for the location strategy instead of um, like text. So, so in this uh, basic UI login, um, and I, what I did was I, I extracted it out so we didn't have to go into the DC user. So if you if you wanted to kind of build upon you know all these um, all these practices, you would you would take this practice and then put it inside of your, your page object. So that way you're, we now have one point of reference uh, for a location strategy. Um, but you'll see this DC user UI login user submit. And in this class, you'll see these just constants. And so you can see, I've got edit name, edit pass, edit submit, and then the login user account link. And so when I run this, I use those instead of having to type out the text. So now, if someone wants to change the name of the um, the login field, or or maybe it's maybe I use XPath and then there's a new div around it, so I have to change you know my XPath location strategy. Then I just do it in this one area, and for the 15 other um, uh, tests that are um, that are using it, if they're using this UI login, I don't have to touch those. So we're kind of centralizing all the changes that we would need to make that are kind of your day-to-day -day thing, like you're, you're going to change the color of the website and you're going to add a new button um, and just making it easier to move forward and, and not have so much pain when things change. And the other th um, thing I wanted to mention from the, from the page object perspective is that the page object shouldn't, um, usually don't want to do assertions inside of your object. You want to leave that to your test. You just want the object to um, to, to, to do the services that it should. Um, like register, log off, it's a home page, create yourself, make yourself the most current, not the current. <clears throat> and what I, what I mean by that in practice is I wouldn't have, you know, you, my user object and I wouldn't tell it to um, assert, you know, assert is logged in. Because then my assertion is now in my, in my user object. The way to do it is that I, I do have in here, this is my account link present. And all it tells me is, is it present or not? And so my assertion test would be, So does that, it's a, it's a slight thing, it's a slight change, but it's kind of important when, you, when, when, you, when you're making a lot of objects is keeping the um, assertions out of the object and keeping them in your test. Um, obviously, in, in the real world, you do put some assertions in there, like am I on the right page? If I'm not on the right page, get on the right page. Or um, you know, if you want a dependency, I couldn't do this because of X, Y, and Z, so the whole thing's not gonna work. But in practice, you wanna keep your assertions in your test and you wanna, and, um, you wanna keep them out of your object. Uh, was there a question or no? Okay, good. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Let's make sure we're doing okay on time. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and then next I'm gonna talk about test APIs. Um, and I probably should have renamed these, uh, renamed this uh, just about helper functions. Um, kind of to the point of a new developer coming in, uh, you should, a test should be super easy to write. There should, you should have tons of helper functions <laughs> just so when you write a test, you're kind of talking to yourself. It's like, okay, I want to open a page, put some text in the header, see if it's there. Um, not thinking, okay, what's the name of that element up there? Uh, you know, how do I get enough words to put up there? It should just be a very simple, um, conversation with yourself so that even if a new developer was to read through it, it's very straightforward. They're not thinking about all the technical um, or the technicalities of, you know, how do, how do I do that? Or for example, a page object, you know, you, you use those to help someone, our new developer or anyone on the team say, okay, how do I create a user? You know, how many registration fields do we have? They shouldn't, they should just be able to say, I need a user. I need them to log in. 
you know, that's two lines of code instead of having to research. And it's also time saved having to research. Do we have new fields? Do we have, you know, so on and so forth. Um, I say keep the, keep the actual test to small one-liners. What I mean by that is, um, you know, not having to, I need to register a user. So you have a block of code that registers a user. You know, split that down into one, you know, with a, with a user object that says register user, done. You know, next line, assert that he was registered or that he got an email, you know, or, or, or whatever. But, you know, try and keep, it's nice to keep them in, to, to one line so it does then read like a story. Um, a utility functions are your friend. Are your friend. Um, obviously, you're going to wrap some calls to make, make things better. Um, and then we, we use uh, this module called test data uh, with Drupal. Uh, is anyone familiar with it? Uh, okay, I'll, test data is um, a way to help you get your testing data in, a, in an efficient manner. Um, that's, a, I think, a, a good summary of it. Um, the way it works, oh, great. <laughs> 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 uh, while I start that back up, do you guys just mind if I just go through the code? Or, uh, okay, because we're running a little short on time. So, oh no, why am I looking in there? Okay. So this is kind of a key area of it. And the, the test data is just a framework to allow you to get a, a set of data, cache it, and then loop through it. So if you think about um, you know, a site that's got a lot of blog posts, and, but those blog posts may have different um, states. So let's take a lot of blog posts. So I need, uh, you know, I need, I've got 100 tests, and each of those are testing something about a blog. Does it have the right header? Can I edit it? Can, if I log in as an editor, can I edit it? A regular user shouldn't be able to. You've got all these iterations, and you always need a random uh, blog post. So every time a test starts, um, and we'll get to this in scale, like, let's say you've got 30 tests, each of them are hitting the database, all trying to pull a random um, blog uh, uh, publish, or a, a random blog uh, entry. And if you ever use the RAND function with MySQL, it's, it's, it can be a little slow. Um, so what test data does is it allows you to basically set um, different data sets. So for example, I have a random blog one, and then I give it a query, and I tell it how what size I want. I think I have it set at 200 or 2,000, and the URL format that, that it's going to uh, use to get to that item or to, to that ID. So you see the NID here, and then you see the URL format. And it's just going to replace whatever comes back from here with that. And, but this stays in cache. So this query, it runs it, and then it puts them all in cache. So when you come back and you say, I need a random, uh, a random blog entry, it gives you one from cache. It gives you the next one. It's got an internal pointer. So then you have a, a, a data set, and then, and, it, and then you can just go through it from cache instead of ever having to hit your database. This helps to speed up your test, um, depending on usually uh, you run this on your same um, uh, site that you're testing, obviously, because it needs access to the database. And you can loop through it through cache. And then, obviously, so like we said, we have different states. So one might need a random blog. One might need a random blog with comments. One might need one without comments. One might need one with comments uh, disabled. You can think of like all the different iterations that, that you'll need, and instead of having to all you know, come up with this framework of okay, I, you know, how do I get that? Or you've got this one query sitting in your test area. It all sits in here. It all sits cached, and it and it and it helps your performance of your tests. Um, does that framework make sense? And you can see it in action here, um, where it does. It looks for everything that's implemented a certain hook, and then it uh, pulls the test data from from that, and then it, then it goes to the next one. So it's like go to the and your URL formats are go to and then um, go to next and then whatever your test data set is. So I'd say go to next random blog, go to next random blog without comments. And it's all coming from cache. Is there a D7 version of that? There's currently not a D7 version of that. Um, I don't know if there will be, if unless the community writes it, um, but or unless we write it. 
Well, which is maybe a possibility. But it's um, the basic premise of it is not very complicated. It's, it wouldn't be a very hard, I shouldn't say not very complicated, but it's not uh, something that would be very hard to rewrite in D, in D7. No, all the examples I've given here are um, using D6, but um, these examples aren't, are supposed to be agnostic of um, any Drupal limitation. It's really about um, testing an application. So with, with test data, you could write this in a different language, Ruby or something. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's more the concepts that I, I kind of want everyone to take away from, um, not so much the specific implementation of uh, Drupal or anything. Um, for example, organizing your tests is something you can do with any testing framework. But yeah, the, the examples I've, I've, I'm using in terms of the only thing that's D6 is the site and also the module I made as a helper, uh, which I haven't really touched on. PHP unit is what we've mostly been in. Um, and I, th I believe I'm using 3.7, 3.1.7. Um, but yeah, so they've been in D6, but yeah. Yes. Uh, say that one more time. The feature files. The, the, uh, the feature files. Oh, so, um, uh, f feature or fixture? Feature, f feature files, right? Is he asking like the like the behead? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the Um, yeah. um, well, so why did I choose PHP unit to make the test? Um, well, for because I want to use it for this tech, for this talk with WebDriver and Selenium, and for something like Behat and what you're talking about, it's a different paradigm to, to me. Anyway, it's it's something that um, is for, is everyone familiar with Behat and and how it works. So B, B hat, and I believe what you're mentioning features, you actually write out text. You say, you know, given that a user has logged in, next line, um, check, check that they have a My Account link. And then it, it splits this out into tests. It takes actual, you know, um, natural language and splits it out into, into tests. And then you, you basically fill in those tests. But from there, then anytime someone says given, and it uses regex, so given a user's logged in, that test is already written. And so you get all these little tests and people can just write um, paragraphs, you know, or, or tests in, in natural English, um, you know, very easy. Is, is, if, am I following? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, so, I'm sorry? Uh, oh, I haven't, I haven't used it. Yeah, so yeah, so we use yeah, Java does have it, but we use we're using PHP um, or we're using PHP unit just cuz we in our organization we don't have a lot of Java developers, but Java usually always has uh, a better implementation even in Selenium 1 than the other bindings. Um, we're the web driver actually uses a, what's called the JSON wire pro protocol. Um, so that's what PHP unit uses, so it doesn't have the close relationship uh, with with uh, Selenium that, that Java that Java does, and I I believe .NET has a has a close relationship also in terms of its implementation. So PHP's implementation is using the JSON wire protocol, and and it's only only those things are available to it unless we go use something like Behat, which kind of implements that. But yeah, I mean yeah, yeah you're right, and I think that'll always be like that because it's I think obviously there Selenium is in Java, and it, and they always take the interface and they. You know, I, I was frustrating in Selenium 1 because you've got this interface in Java. You can go read the Java docs. And you're like, oh, I, I, that's the function I need. And you go and look for it, you know, on, the, on their interface of the, of the protocol. And it's like, ah, oh, it's, it's not available there, though. You know, it's like, hmm? Did I answer your question there? Yes. Yeah. Do you know Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can actually. Yeah, we, we run a full headless uh, test system. Um, and all the tests work with Jenkins. Uh, we have a, you know, it, yeah, we, we, um, we run builds based off, we have a continuous integration environment in the last step of it. It runs a simple test and then it runs all of our um, Selenium tests through it. Yeah, um, so I wanted to go through um, actually um, 
uh, I, was, I wanted to go through an example of scaling out your, your development environment. Um, but, and I, but I was not going to go through setting up a continuous integration environment, though. Um, that, that's kind of beyond, I mean, it's kind of beyond this. But um, yeah, I did want to go through scaling, you know, or just at least talk about it. I don't, I don't think we're going to have time for it. Um, but no, I, I wasn't going to go through a CI, a CI today. Just as a side note, uh, uh, there was a mention of BHAT, which will be the next session mm -hmm. on this track after lunch. Yep. And there will also be uh, uh, talks about uh, CI and Drupal uh, CI processes and things like that. So just stay tuned. And let's see. So last but not least. Um, OK. <clears throat> OK, we have our PowerPoint back. Apologize about Microsoft. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it's true. Did someone call them over? <laughs> okay. Well, um, while that's loading up, I can I I know what I'm talking about. So, um, or next anyway. Uh, so in terms of scaling, there's there's kind of I I think of it in three steps. Um, scaling scaling your tests. Um, and then scaling your dev environment. Oh wait, hang on a second. I can't click anywhere. Yeah. Because <sighs> I'm on a ten twenty four. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh yeah, that always works. I can't even. Oh, thank you. No. Yep. <laughs> you gave me hope, though. There we go. That always works. Uh, I'm gonna go. I've got. I've got a fix for this. Look at that. Okay. So <clears throat> I need to start it now. Oh, because I'm looking at the PDF. All right, so the first thing I, I wanted to talk about was um, scaling the test. And is, is anyone here familiar with Paratest? So Paratest is a, a multi-threaded runner for, for PHP unit. You know, they aim to run for you know, any testing framework. Oh, OK, we're back. Um, so you know, scale the tests. And then scale Selenium. We're going to talk about the Selenium grid, and then scale the test environment. Um, and uh, I would say the hardest of these is is a third one, your your development environment. And the and the reason I mention this is scaling the test is is pretty uh, straightforward. There's things that'll just break it out into like 30, 40 threads, and you can you know pound at it. There's third parties that'll help you you know um, run multiple Selenium on the grid, like uh, Sauce Labs. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, um, but after that, you've got 60 tests running at the same time. But if but if you don't have a test environment that can handle 60 tests pounding at it, you know then you know it's it's all for nothing. You know that that's your one bottleneck. And so I would say if if you were going, you know if you're if you're dealing with this, um, you know you can scale the test to a certain point, but at at some point you're going to need to scale your development environment. Um, you know, taking your one environment, maybe putting on four machines, and then doing a round robin. If you have, uh, you know, the the wherewithal and the resources to put in a, a load balancer in front, so it does it for you. But just something that either uh, loads it out, or, or you can spend the money and buy like a 16 node cluster or something like that. But you know, I, I think it'd probably be easier to to, to scale it out. Um, so first, uh, we'll talk about uh, Paratest, and I chose the three-headed monster because it's uh, Anytime you have threads, it can be 
be a little scary. Um, Paratus is a multi-threaded runner for PHP unit. Uh, it's the only one I've found that actually works well. Uh, because if you if you have a dependency, for example, and PHP unit has the ability to filter, so if you, to filter on one test. So if I do a command like um, PHP unit, and I want to filter. Oh, oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So if I do, you know, like you know, filter that. Um, then, I, then it, it will only run that one test. The problem is if that test has a dependency that's in another file, it'll fail because PHP unit isn't smart enough to um, go and load the other file as a dependency so that when the test runs, it runs a dependency and then runs that test. Um, Paratest um, gets around that because it does, then it looks at all the tests and it kind of knows the dependency tree. So when it goes, and if you think about, if you were gonna do this yourself, the first thing you would do is find out how many tests you have, split those into different threads, you know, make a thread stack and put them you know, on, on each one, and that's when you run into the dependency problem. Paratest basically does that, but it, it, then it's smart enough to load it the correct way to say, okay, this test has this dependency, this file needs to be loaded with it, so then that test can go out and be run. Um, anyone see my mouse pointer? There it is. So I, I do like uh, Paratest, um, and I, I don't really have other suggestions <laughs> um, for doing it. It's it's a successor to uh, Sauce Labs started it with uh, another uh, test runner, and then this is kind of the um, the successor to it, and, and, and it's pretty good. Uh, next is the grid. Um, Selenium Grid is a way to, uh, for example, I'm running on my local machine, and the grid puts it out onto multiple machines. So I can then take, um, you know, six different computers and 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 uh, each one with different configurations and run them from one area. And when I run my tests, it it puts them out on different machines. It's also smart enough to know that this machine only has Internet Explorer on it. This one has Firefox and Internet Explorer. So when you send it, it sends it to the right machine. Um, and I can go over the grid. How many people have worked with the Selenium grid before? No. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick example of both the grid and um, Paratest. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to shut down my standalone server. Oh, you guys can't see that, can you? <laughs> Let me turn on mirroring. <clears throat> okay, the first thing I'm going to do is... Um, So I've shut down my um, standalone server, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a hub. And all this is, it's the same jar file, and the nice part about this is everything, Selenium 1, Selenium 2, Selenium Grid, it's all in the same file, if you get the, the, the big one. Um, so anyway, it, we, we run the jar file, and we just run it as a hub. So I'm going to start the hub. <coughs> And then I'm going to start two nodes. And you'll see what I've done here. I've, I just changed the role to node. I told it where the hub is. And I also told it that the, the maximum number of sessions is one, just because um, my laptop can't really handle a lot of things. So um, I'm going to start two nodes, each with a maximum of one session. So you can see that the grid is going to put one test on uh, uh, one node and the other test on the other node. So I'm going to go ahead and start that up. I'm going to start a second node over here. I'm just giving you different port numbers. That's what that number afterwards is. Um, so what the what the nodes do is they start up, and I told it where the hub is, and then they pull for the for the hub, and they register themselves, and they also all this information here is um, is its capabilities. So the node will tell the hub, these are my capabilities. We're running out of time. Okay, um, so you can see it here, and you can see I've got two <coughs> remote proxies, and then I'm going to go ahead and run Paratest. Just make sure I do the right one. And I'm telling it just to use two processes. 
because I don't want to kill my computer. Um, and then the dash F just means functional. Um, by default, it does suites in each thread, and I just want it to do each single function in one thread. So we don't really t care about the test running. It's going to run it, and we're going to see them pop up. So there's one. And there's the other. And then if I go to the grid, you'll see these have dimmed out, because now it's saying we've got one concurrent test. And then it's just going to keep going, because now it's splitting it between the two. And you see this is one node, and this is the other node. And it's splitting it between the two as the tests come in. So that's how the node, that's how the, the grid works. And you can scale this out to multiple machines. As you can guess, I could do a tunnel to my remote machine that's headless and put, and put test over there. So then you can start to scale out your tests. So now we've got uh, pair of tests running in parallel. We've got our grid set up. And obviously, the last thing is after you scale that up, you've got to scale your development environment, because if, if, if you've got, you know, 30 threads running at the same time, you've got to be able to handle that um, that kind of load. Um, and I think I'm, I might be out of time. I want to leave some Q&A. Does anyone have any, any questions or comments are fine, too? Uh, yes, well, with the? Oh, with, with contact information? Um, Oh, this one? The first one with the list with the URL for your slide. Oh, 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 yes, yes, yes. Okay. There you go. That one. Uh, is WebDriver ready to be used? And if so, which browsers? It is. It can be used. Um, again, with uh, the drawbacks of WebDriver, um, I, I also should have mentioned, like anything, there are some bugs. Um, for example, in Chrome, and I don't know the specifics, but one of the event fires isn't, isn't perfect. They're working on that. Um, and you need a separate, you have to download a driver, because like we said, each browser uses its native driver. So you have to download a driver for Chrome to, for it to drive, uh, for it to be driven. But I would say it's ready to be used. Um, definitely. Um, they've already deprecated Selenium 1, so Selenium 2 is where they're going at WebDriver. Um, but, I, but it's, again, not a magic pill. There's, like anything, going to be some bugs here and there and some growing pains, but I'd, I'd say it's ready to be used. Yes? Uh, what's, in your opinion, the main advantage of using this over uh, Behat? Well, I, again, so with the, the Hat talk, um, it's really, I, th I think you should go to it. I, I think for me, I take Behat as a different animal because this is a, this is a, a, a testing tool and Behat is, is um, it's almost something like, if, especially if you have an organization, a, a lot of buy-in because you could, you know, you, for example, you have a user story and you have someone who wants something done or even if you're a consultant, you give them the functional paragraph, like given the user's logged in, and it's you know eight o'clock. Give them a lottery ticket, right? And then you put that functionality. You give it to your client. The client's like, yes, I sign off on that. And that contract is now kind of living, breathing, because now you have tests that adhere to this exact contract. And so now it's kind of a more I, I take it as kind of an organizational thing. I mean, you could use it just as a pure QA tool, but I don't really see much benefit of that other, over all the other things that are out there for QA tools of just driving a browser based upon, because you, you know you get the specs, like, okay, the user needs to log in and look at this, and like, okay, well, you translate it, you put it there, but you're always doing a proxy in between you <clears throat> and the person who wants the feature. You know, they're saying one thing, you're implementing the, the test, and you might have to tweak it, it's like, oh, I, I meant this, you know, but when you, have, when, you, when you have this, like, natural language that says, like, given the user's logged in, and it's six o'clock, or, you, or you, you specify more like, oh, actually, um, I need the background, the lottery ticket to be gray. Given the user's logged in, and it's after eight o'clock, give them the lottery ticket that is gray. And now, you're, now you have, you know, okay, now we have a contract that says this is what we want. So I, 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 to me, they don't purely totally equate on, on a technical level, maybe, because you can write things under them. <clears throat> like Bahat can use a web driver, a wa waiter, you know, anything underneath to, to drive the test. It has a pure uh, HTTP tester that'll just do curl commands. So it doesn't even fire up a browser. So if you need like you know pure speed and you know you don't need JavaScript, it'll just do that. Um, <clears throat> but you know I think 
with all that architecture, I think there's something else like, there when you when you're when you're talking about you know like natural language and 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 whatnot. So that that's my personal opinion. I'm sorry, but uh, we'll have to end here. Uh, we'll continue the testing thread in uh, the subsequent sessions, and of course, uh, uh, Ernest is uh, available to you for personal uh, talks. Um, so, uh, but uh, we'll have the end the, the official session here. Thank you, to Ernest. Well, simple test covers the need for functional tests, but um, for like a, in a integration tests, for, like, for example, AJAX forms and, and, and full stack integration things, you need something like, like WebDriver that actually launches a browser that um, you know, does pop-up windows, because simple tests has a, a very simple um, uh, mechanism for it, it does basically curl commands when it does a firmware posting. So if you, have like a, if you need to test that, you know, when I, um, when I hover over this text box, this pops up. You know, you can't, you can't do that in simple tests. And so you need something like, like Selenium or whatever. But on the Selenium driver and PHP unit, you can't do anything. It doesn't cover all what you, what you can do in single test. Like the, the PHP unit and the Selenium can cover anything that you are doing with simple test. Yes, 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 it's far better. Yes. It's far better. The migration to PHP to PHP unit testing is because it's so. Why much didn't you to go process. all the way and just eliminate it? Because because if you're if you're gonna, for example, if I need to just test like an algorithm, I need to. Make sure that the, this does um, one plus one is equal to two. You know, I can just test that function in simple test very quickly. Where, like you saw the setup on this, it's got to, I got to fire up that. I've got to wait for the browser to pop up. So it's it's speed and, it, and it's just kind of overhead. Yeah, but the and other thing is, is that there's a, yeah, I, I've got a I've got a talk that goes into this, but I'm not doing it here. But basically. You have unit testing, which is things like the functions you're talking about, and then you have the UI testing, which is a different le level. A lot of what he was showing is that higher level testing. You still need to do all of the other testing. And you can do it in PHP unit, you can do it in simple test, and the reason everything's migrating away from simple test to PHP unit testing is for standards. It's, it's I would, too complicated. I would definitely not and recommend doing all your tests in Selenium. And <laughs> maybe that relates to the other question that I have is, is anything of that can also cover the need for testing theming level yes. or UI? Yes, definitely. Yes. definitely. Uh, because you showed only things like forms and, and well, functional yeah, testing. I wanted to keep the examples very simple. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah, I didn't want people to get like caught up in uh -huh. everything. Like you keep, and, and I wanted to use the same example throughout so everyone kind of could build off and say, I've seen that before, what's different? Okay. You know, it, 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 was it, was good, it was a good intro. It was a really yeah, good yeah, intro. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you, covered, you covered basics and you stepped through it. It was, it was good. Uh, you, you, got bit, you got bit by, by Murphy's Law of like <laughs> those, uh, uh, two or three times there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, uh, didn't even get and that you one. also got to do the first one. So <laughs> thank, you, thank you for taking, yeah, I'm taking the bullet for the rest I'm of it. I'm glad it's over. Yeah, so I can bring that up. Um, oh, and that's, that's what I was going to say. Was I went ahead and started trying to do the continuous integration piece. Mm -hmm. It became so long that it was I couldn't do it within yeah, the time frame either, so don't feel bad about yeah, that. I mean, yeah. It's a huge piece. You need a whole lab for that. Yeah, exactly. I'll, t I'll talk to you later. Okay. Yeah, so this... There, there is, um, but I, uh, the, I don't know if it'll go into headless Selenium. So, but yeah, it'll it'll get you started. It, um, it, there's no there's no display, so there could be a box there, but it's, it's running Firefox. It, it it does it's doing AJAX requests and pop-ups, but we call it headless because there's no display actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the next VFB buffer, and then it just runs in the frames. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, this is this is ours, and all of our tests are. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I'll be around all, all day. I, um, I have another talk tomorrow, um, so um, so I have some prep for that, and then after that.